so hi everyone we are so happy and thrilled to um to start this pilot zico fellowship here at y academy um we're supposed to start monday but uh, the onboarding process uh that took slightly longer on friday we received a burst of applications and we wanted to look through them all so we ended up sending some acceptance letters like kind of late so we wanted to give two more days for everyone to 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 uh have a time to stake and and finish the onboarding process but we are all here uh, and we're all excited i appreciate all the enthusiasm from you guys uh this will be our first zk auditing fellowship so we are all learning as we go along and we do hope that uh it will be enjoyable that's the most important thing enjoyable and also informative as well uh so as i said this is our pilot zk fellowship program it will probably evolve differently from our smart contract fellowships uh, if you have uh, seen those or if you, if you have been through those we'll see we have a group of amazing mentors uh from y academy itself and from the outside as well uh we are doing module 1 this week um potentially all the way to monday monday will be our the last of the lectures and then we are going to begin our auditing sprint next week uh so uh, it will start wednesday uh, that's the overview session of the code base and it will go on for like 10 to 14 days depending on how we progress depending on some sessions that we may may have in in the middle things like that and depending also on how we see your progress how you're you know grappling with the code base and then module 3 after that same thing it will be another code base um we may have a retreat period between module 2 and 3 we'll see um uh, we are thinking of doing uh, like retreat sessions where we dig into theory and implementation of a specific primitive in in the zk snark machinery uh but yeah we'll 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 see um Y Academy is an open community. We welcome everyone who seeks and share knowledge. Um yes, we will have a ZK residency program similar to our smart contract auditing residency. So if you have a good time and you show genuine interest and in learning and teaching as well, we would be happy to invite you to stay as a resident as well. Uh we would love to see you all excel and take your skills back to the ecosystem somewhere. whether back to a project you're working with or as a solo auditor or just as a security minded developer or researcher the, there has been some amazing examples of people who graduated from Y Academy and went on to do amazing amazing things and this is core to our ethos and mission as a as a public good program namely we want to flood the ecosystem with competent auditors the 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 health and the future of this amazing technology we believe in depends on that um we do inv- as i said we do invite exceptional fellows to stay like if you are not going back to a project or you want to go to solo you have a home here with us as well as residents if you choose to uh, and you are invited uh it has been increasingly uh, getting more competitive to to get into y academy but you know with zk we are just starting so it's early and you do have a chance to excel and build a career with us if you if you if you want oops uh these are just some points for you to note take advantage of this opportunity of being in the presence of talented people your fellows your fellow fellows <laughs> and your and the mentors please learn and share more most importantly uh we will guide you through but we also need you to put in the effort as well as we say why academy fellowships are not they are not training programs they are not one on one introductory to something they are and they have always been from the conception they are trial by fire auditing programs so the fellows are expected to follow along and pick up like quite quickly So before we get to the lecture uh any questions about administrative stuff like a few quick questions if you have
Okay. Excellent. Um, I'm happy that there is no questions. That means everything is clear and we are ready to get started. So the, the first module from now until Monday, this is something I'm calling ZK in context. Okay. So today is the first of three or four part series that I'm calling ZK in context. And I, I put this together specifically for aspiring ZK auditors. You know, as an auditor and in contrast to developers, for example, you can't really abstract away stuff. You have to scrutinize everything, which means you have to understand everything. And as you may know, there is a lot that goes into the ZK snark uh, machinery. Um, You can imagine that complexity as a forest. And if you work hard by running around this forest, trying to consume everything in your way, you may get drought. There is a lot of amazing introductory materials out there. Uh, and we will, of course, curate and share some of it uh, for you in this fellowship, especially those relevant to our audits. But you may still get overwhelmed if you don't come from a CS background. So hopefully these lectures will ease you into it and provide you with a framework that helps you understand why, why the prover verifier model works. Um, why it works and where it came from and the context, more importantly, the context in which it has evolved. So to summarize my motivation with these lectures, in the in the past, uh, excuse me. In the past five fellowships, we we did it here at Y Academy over the past one and a half years or so. We noticed that some of the best auditing talent that graduated and went on to do amazing things did not have a CS or software background. Some did not even have a technical background at all. Um, the auditing brain seems to be unique in some ways. So I prepared the, this series with, th with that in mind. I want it to be inclusive of people like this and to make sure they don't slip through the cracks and the ecosystem loses them. If you do have a CS background or if you have done some reading and tinkering with proofing systems, this series could still hopefully declutter some things and put them into uh, a coherent framework. This is the general agenda of the first module in this uh, pilot Zika fellowship of this series of lecture, basically. We will take a step back and we will look at this fundamental uh, thing that we call uh, computation. Um, what is the nature of computation? How does it fit, epistemologically speaking, in the corpus of, of human thought? Uh, you may be surprised to learn how foundational, how universal this notion is, and how it is more general and universal than just crunching numbers. We want to understand the cost of computation. We want to touch and feel what it means for computations, aka questions, aka truths, or aka algorithms, to be easy or hard. Um, as you will see, the, the, these these words are all uh, are, are are identical. Computations, questions, truths, algorithms—they are all the same thing, as we will see. And then finally, we will look. So we're starting here, or we're going that way. We will finally look at this concept that is fundamental to computing in zero knowledge, which is arithmetization. And if you haven't heard of it, don't worry. We will get to that in due time. Now, the one concept that ties all this together is reduction. Um, internalizing this concept and understanding its fundamental role at establishing major theorems in all of these leaves will, I believe, demystify a lot of things. And it will make your ZK journey, hopefully, a lot easier. Uh, once we have this clear view, you can then start attacking some corners of the ZK snark machinery in isolation. So this holistic view will 
hopefully allow you to start then attacking those uh, <clears throat> specific corners of the ZK forest in isolation. And you will always rely on the fact that if you get stuck somewhere, at least you know where you are. You will have a mental map of the forest so you can navigate your way back home. So the strategy is kind of like two-sided. We try to get a holistic understanding at first, which then clears the way for us to attack in depth uh, some concepts in isolation, some concepts in probability theory, abstract algebra, things like that. Uh, we will come back to highlight the strategy at the end of the series. Uh, we will not get to attack every corner of the forest in this fellowship, that's for sure. Uh, but should you continue your journey into ZK, I believe and I hope that this context will help you manage that complexity on your own. That's more important. We will end here where we started. We'll start here and we'll end, we'll end here. If you don't know about these reductions, don't worry, we'll go over them. Um, so hopefully at the finish line, you know, uh, we, we, we put everything in perspective and we clear the color, uh, the, the, the clutter that we generated. We're going to generate some clutter along the way. Uh, you might feel, where is this going? But hopefully by the end, it will all kind of make sense. Okay. With that short intro, let's dig in. So consider these two sets, U and S. Um, every element in S is a subset of U. So S is a set of sets, and each of those sets is an element of U. And the question is, is there a subset that we're calling T that covers U? And covering means Every element of U is contained in exactly one element of the solution set that we are constructing, T. So we're trying to find a sub-collection of these guys um, such that they do not intersect. They are completely disjoint, exactly one element. Um, and together, the union of all of them in this T, the union of all the elements in this solution set T, uh, is equivalent to you, basically. So instinctively, if you look at this, this question, instinctively, you may see the solution with the largest set in S. With the reasoning that, you know, it gets you a long way to covering you. You know, it takes you a long way. So you, you may start with S3, for example, So if you start with S3, it's the largest set in S. And then you say, okay, I'm going to now start picking the smallest set and try to hopefully plug in the holes, basically. S3 covers four elements of U. So we're going to try the next smallest one and try to fill in the holes. That would be S4. But that doesn't work because... S3 and S4 are not disjoint. They both have the element three. So that doesn't work. So you throw away, you throw away uh, S4, we're still at S3. You throw away S4 and you try S2, but that doesn't work also because, you know, they, they intersect with three as well. Same thing with S5, they intersect with the set uh, with the element two, basically. Notice that we are doing this naively because we are not actually systematically exploring the search space. At this tab right there, we may add a set to our partial solution, which does not intersect with what we have previously, um, but it may haunt us down the road. It may be the reason we don't stumble upon the correct solution. We are sort of committing early 
to, to, to a set. In other words, partial solutions may lead nowhere. Uh, we saw this when we picked three and then S4, we got stuck. So we committed to S4 uh, and we got stuck right away. Now, you may try another instinct, which is kind of the opposite. We'll start with the smallest sets, which is in this case, S4. With the reasoning that they are more likely to be disjoint sets. You know, if you start with the small ones, you have less likelihood of, you know, start hitting the, the uh, uh, joint with other sets. So we start with S4 and we try S1. It doesn't work because of the three. Two, the same thing. Um, five, same thing. We have two. So we, we started with the smaller set and we got stuck right away as well. We committed to four because of this instinct that we we have. We committed to it and then it got us nowhere basically. Uh, same thing here, same strategy. Uh, we, we, we commit to, to sets along the way and they may be good for now, but they, they get us stuck later on. Of course, all of the, like this strategy overall is, is not really systematically exploring every path. So it, it is naive and it will not lead the solution because we are committing to, to a set here, which, which gets us stuck as we saw in, in both cases. So obviously this doesn't work. Uh, neither instinct worked, so you throw them out and you say, screw it, I'm just going to try every possible combination. I'm going to do an exhaustive search. And once you do, uh, you will find the solution to be uh, S5 and S1. So as you can see, the, the elements of uh, S5, 1, 2, and 4, 1, 2, and 4, and 3, 5, 6. Together, S1 and S5 is the solution. They, they cover the set you. If you take their union, you will get you again. Um, but you only got the solution because you, you exhaustively tried all the different combinations, basically. So it seems that we would have to accept the fact that we may have to backtrack all the way to our very first choice. Right? Whatever choice we make along the way, we may have to go back and try something else. So which basically means, okay, we start somewhere, we make a selection, we choose some S, and we have multiple choices that we can take. We can, there are um, at least four other sets that we can choose. So which one we do we choose? As we saw, you pick one, say this one, you say, okay, I'm going to go along this path. Um, and then you add the next one. For this one, you will also have three more choices to make um, and so on. And if you're lucky, maybe you are thus far, maybe you, you the solution is still working, but there is no guarantee that at some point here, you will get stuck. So both choices will end up being not good. So you have to backtrack and you say, okay, I'm not going to try this one. I'm going to try this one instead and so on. Um, in the worst case, depending on the instance you're dealing with, you may find yourself having to go all the way back to the very first choice that you made. And then you try a different path on the, on the first level and so on. Okay, let's consider another problem. So you are traveling and you packed the essentials and there is 100, 1,200 grams left before reaching the airline uh, limit for your carry-on. Um, the total weight of the items that you haven't packed yet, these are the items that you haven't packed yet and you can still add some of them and their total weight is 2,900 gram, which is larger than the capacity. You, you can't exceed this capacity. So obviously you'll have to leave some items behind. You can't have all of them. 
Uh, the items, they have different values. You call it utility to you. Uh, you value some of them. You know, your air dryer is way more valuable to you than your gel, for example, because your hair is amazing as it is, <laughs> let's say. So you have some value for each one of them. What you want, you know, out of spite for the airlines, you want to squeeze out every gram from the limit that you have. But you also want to maximize the value of the items that you pack. You want your utility function here to be maximal as possible. So we're minimizing weight, we are maximizing value. So the question is, is there a selection of items whose weights add up to exactly 1,200 grams, squeezing out every available gram. There is a related and harder question, which is asking for the absolute maximum value that you can get while under the weight of 1,200 grams. So this question is this harder question. It's harder because you're asking from all possible solutions that add up to 1,200, what is the one that gives me the best value? So we call this one a decision question, a yes or no decision question, and we call this one an optimization question, and which is harder. So here's a possible strategy. We sort ascendingly by weight, add items one by one, and we stop when, we, uh, when adding one more element causes us to go above the uh, limit. So here's the items sorted ascendingly. Um, we start adding. So we add the first one, second one, third one. So far, the total weight is 500. So we keep going. 700, 1,000 gram. And now we have to stop because adding this element causes us to go above the limit. So we stop here. And the value that we got is 1 plus 3 is 4, 6, 7, plus 4 is 11. So we get a total value of 11. And the total weight is 1,000. OK? So this is basically same thing. Another instinct would be to sort descendingly by value, add one by one again, and stop if we exceed the limit. So here are the items sorted from the highest value to the lowest value. Um, and then we start adding again. Same as we did before. So we add the first item, second item, third item, and here we have to stop. We have to stop because adding one more element will cause us to go above the limit. 700 plus 300 is 1,000 plus 200 is 1,200, which is our exact limit. And the total value we got, 12, is simply adding these. This is our harvest, basically. Now, the thing is, we have no guarantee. This is better than before. This is better than this. This strategy gave us a uh, better value, and we also squeezed out more weights, so, you know, out of spite for the airlines. But there is really no guarantee that we can't do better. We don't know. We may have stumbled about this first solution, but if we continued searching again, we might find better solution. Remember the questions, the yes or no question versus optimization question. Um, so if we did an exhaustive search, is there, a, is it possible that we could have done better? Indeed, the answer is yes. So, uh, you can see these items that, that, you know, you would have found if you have exhausted all possible searches. Um, and if you add the values, 
that added up to uh, 13, which is better than this, and of course also better than that one. So we could not have known in advance about this. There is, we we did not have a this uh, did not have an instinct that led us to the solution. We only found it because we tried everything basically. Um, and so the exhaustive search did better than than both of them. Okay, so we looked at these two problems and we are starting to notice some similarities between them. <clears throat> Certainly, there's like their search space was like the 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 way the strategy the the instincts that we have in both of them basically uh, translate into into this basically. We both have this notion. We are we 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 tend we we tend to, we seem to be uh, grappling with this notion of make a choice, and take a fork in the road, get stuck potentially and likely backtrack and try something else. So they kind of like seem to be the same at heart. There seems to be something common between them. So can you can we prove actually that they are uh, quote unquote the same at heart? Okay, so we'll do we'll do uh, something interesting. So we will take exact cover instance, and we will translate it into a corresponding instance of the knapsack. Uh, for each subset of S, we will generate a weight value. So we'll generate an item. So for each subset, we will have an item here. We have subset here, we have items here. We'll generate a weight value made up of zeros and ones. And the digit in the weight value is zero if the element in that corresponding index of u is not part of S1. So we have a one in the third digit because the third element of u is present in S1. Five and six are part of uh, S1 as well, so we have one and one in, in those digits. And the same thing for uh for the other for the other items as well. So this is what this basically is saying. This is how we are generating these weights basically, made up of zeros or ones. Um so okay, so we got the weights, and now we need the, the next element in our knapsack, corresponding knapsack is the values. And for values, we're going to assign arbitrary but equal value. So we chose one here, but it doesn't matter. As long as it's the same, um, as long as the value is the same, it doesn't matter as long as it's the same for all of the items. So uh, this is an artificial knapsack instance. We are translating this into that, basically. And, and we'll see now how. So we get the weights and the values. What do we do with the knapsack capacity limit? What should it be? So that one should be one everywhere. The number of digits is equal to the size of u. You will notice the number of digits here is equal to the size of u, the number of elements. And it's one in all of them because we want the subset of these. We're looking for a subset of weights that add up exactly to this which translates in the context of exact cover that every element is a one. That means every element in the subset we selected, once we add them up, we are doing arithmetic addition, adds up to this exact number. So you can see the correspondence here. There we were asking for covering, and here we are asking for an arithmetic results, a subset of weights, a subset of weights, which when added together, arithmetic addition, the regular addition, it will add up exactly to this number, which means in the context of exact cover, once we translate our solution back, it will mean that every element of U is present in each, in one of the subset that we selected. And notice also that it, this also prevents 
imposing this prevents the subset in the solution to have one in the same position. Because remember the requirement, they have to be disjoint. This, the, this subset that we select here have to be disjoint. So if two, two uh, weight had one in the same digit, that digit will add up to two or even more, two plus, which will not correspond to this number. So the solution in this case is obviously adding W1 and W5. And if you add them, you will get this exact number. And if you remember, W1 and W5 correspond to subset one and subset five, which does indeed cover U. It's a correct covering of U. All the elements of U are present in exactly either one or the, or the other. There is no intersection. Uh, so yeah, so we translated the, the solution and we verified that, you know, S1, the union of S1, S5 is, is equal to this, which is equivalent to, to this basically. Okay. So in one context, we dealt with sets and union in, in our algorithms, in our search, we were dealing with sets and union between them. And here we're dealing with numbers, the weights, these are the numbers and addition. Our algorithm is just crunching additions. And here our algorithm is just crunching unions, basically. And we saw how the two are kind of have a nice, uh, cute uh, correspondence. So to summarize what we did, we reduced an exact cover instance to a corresponding knapsack instance. We solved the knapsack instance, and then we translated the solution back to the original context. Um, the translation is straightforward because, you know, uh, we have five ways, we have five sets. The, the correspondence is, is pretty obvious. Um, so this is basically the, the steps of the reduction from this set into that set. And uh, if you ever have a, an algorithm for the knapsack, then you automatically have an algorithm for exact cover because you just do this translation. And one important thing to notice is that this reduction is relatively cheap. When we generated this, when we generated the instance, we were not really doing any kind of fancy search or anything. It's just a correspondence that we are uh, creating basically. Uh, and this is a very, very important point. Um, the fact that there is a covering of U in the set S, if and only if there is a subset of weights that add up to this number. So notice how um, how this, it, it's not like, uh, you know, um, it's a very, very hard correspondence. If this one has no solution, we are guaranteed that this one, the knapsack, the corresponding knapsack will not have a solution, 100%. But to be sure of that, we can generalize the reduction so that it's not a specific instance because you can say, well, it worked for this instance, but what about the the, the general case, basically. Um, so let's see how we can create a generalized reduction from arbitrary exact cover to an arbitrary knapsack. Oh, sorry. Arbitrary exact cover to an exact knapsack instance for any instance that is a corresponding exact instance. Well, assuming that you set, you are setting the values to always to one, for example. Uh, but the capacity and the weights are certainly, uh, will certainly be unique. So the first thing we do, <clears throat> we have a matrix. Okay. And the IJ element in the matrix is one. If the Jth element of SI is contained, uh, if the jth element of U is contained in that set. So each row here, the first row, correspond to the first set in S. And the, uh, the digits, the first digit of 
of the first row is one if the first element in S1, uh, if the first element of U is present in S1. So I'll repeat that again. The first element, this is A11 is the first element, uh, is one if the first element of U is present in the subset S1. A21 correspond to the fact whether the first element of U is present in S2 and so on. So we have this matrix. Um, and then we generate, deterministically, we generate the weights. The weights. Notice that we have M number of weights corresponded to M, uh, the M uh, number of subsets. And this basically says that we are generating those ones and zeros, you know, one, zero, one, one, et cetera. This is, this is just doing that because, you know, uh, it, it, the, the multiplication two to the power K minus one, just, you know, uh, the first digit is one, the second digit is 10, a hundred and so on. Um, so now we have the weights. Uh, values are constant, as before. So we set them all to one. Um, and the capacity is two to the n, to the number of elements in, in U minus one. So it's basic, this basically says it's one, 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 one. And the number of ones here will be equivalent to n, to the size of U, basically. This is basically what this is saying. So in case you missed it, W1 is basically the first row treated as a number made up of ones and zero. W2 is the second row and so on. WM is the last row here. You just take it and treat it as a number, basically. That's basically what we're doing. By the way, if there are any questions, anytime, please feel free to, to interrupt. I'm not looking at the chat, for example, by the way, but uh, I don't know if Kat is uh, is here if he if he wants to interrupt with those questions. Okay, and these are the two questions, equivalent questions in the general form. Is there a subset T of S that covers U? And the question in the knapsack context: Is there a subset O of W that adds up to C? So again, we're dealing with sets here, and we're dealing with uh, um, with numbers and union, with, with numbers and additions, number and additions, sets and union, basically. So this is a generalized reduction, and it allows you to take any arbitrary instance and turn it into that. It describes exactly what you have to do. And again, as you can see, the the reduction the computational cost of the reduction is not that high, right? The matrix size, you know, it's N by N. So we did not exceed, massively exceed the size of the, 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 the exact cover instance. So if U and S are in, they fit in our memory, then this matrix will also fit in our memory. We, it's not like we are generating some kind of exponentially sized, um, uh, data structure in the knapsack uh, correspondence. Um, and also in terms of like CPU time, that is, we are not crunching or searching for anything. Generating this is basic, you know, you take the first row and you treat it as a number or you do this calculations basically, which is not that expensive at all. These two are basically constant. It's just one computation. So the point is, the reduction, the reduction is quote unquote easy. The reduction itself does not worry us. Unlike the search itself, unlike searching for the optimal solution, which is kind of like expensive. And that's it. We kind of done. So you have the exact cover defined generally, and then you have the corresponding knapsack. They have a, a procedure that you um, 
that you follow in order to generate that uh, that in, that respond against this. Okay, I'll pause and look at the chat in case there are questions. Uh, okay, it seems there was some question. Okay, Vincent asked, why could there be a two one? Um, okay, yeah, I'm not sure uh, what you meant by that. Okay. Okay, so let me go back and try to. So Vincent was asking about this, uh, this one, I guess. A21. So in well, let's look at it from the in the example instead of this one. So A21, it would be this digit right there. Zero. And it is zero because the first element is in U one is not present in the set S2. Let me Okay, so yeah, A to one in the matrix correspond basically to this. Uh, let's take some other digit. Let's take the last digit in W5. This corresponds to the last, okay, last digit in W5 is a zero because the last member of U, six, is not present in S5, which correspond to W5. Let me put this also in color. Okay, repeating one more time, let's take an arbitrary digit. Let's say the second digit, the second digit of W4 is one, because two, which is the second member of U, is indeed present in the set S4. S4 corresponds to W4. So one here, second digit is one, because the second member of U is a member of S4. I hope that clears it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Of course, you know, I, I, I did this in, for illustration purposes. We created this matrix and based on that, you know, it's for, for, it's just to explain where each W is coming from. But of course, in reality, you, you don't need to generate this matrix. You can right away, you can right away start populating the W. You don't read the matrix right away. You can populate it with this formula right there. Um, so this formula is basically saying if you have the number 11 is basically one times 10 to the power zero plus one times 10 to the power one, basically. So that's how you generate a number in a, in a specific base. Okay, so that's the generalized question, the reduction from this one to that one. <clears throat> but for fun, uh, I actually left some... I left a bug in the reduction just so we can have some fun because this is an auditing fellowship. So <laughs> why don't we um, uh, look at just looking at the chat because we're okay. So block death. Thank you. You did some clarification there. Um, so yeah, there is a bug in our reduction here. So let's try to find it. And the bug is here. Uh, I don't know if you guys can spot what the bug is. 
remember, we're generating these numbers made up of ones and zeros. And in our search algorithm, the knapsack solver, basically, what are we doing? We are adding Ws in different combinations. We are exhaustively trying to crunch all possible different paths of addition, adding this to that, right? So, you know, you can think what happens when you add these numbers? Is there a bug there that we did not pay attention to? Um, so far, implicitly, I was, you know, describing arithmetic addition, and the implicit assumption is that we are doing this in base 10, right? And here, we only have five subsets. So we got five weights corresponding to it. So the maximum number of subsets that we would be adding up in our search for a solution is five. Yeah. Um, and if you add five numbers made up of zeros and ones, right, uh, the maximum value that you could get in a specific, in the, in the same digit place is basically five, which is fine, right? You, you will add it and you will get a number, you know, one, 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 five, zero, uh, one, one in your, in your search, for example. Right. And you will know that it's not a solution because this is a five and this is a zero. They cannot be a correct solution. So the arithmetic works fine. Right. But what happens? Suppose that we have 12 sets, which means we will get 12 corresponding weights, which means, right. It means what? It means it is possible that we would be adding in the process of solving the knapsack. It's possible that we would be adding 10, 11, 12 weights together in the process of search. And what happens when you add 10 or more digits, all of value one? You get a problem. You get a problem because adding 10 or more sets will result in a carry, right? Suppose we are operating in base two, not base 10, and we have two numbers, one zero, one one. If you add them, these two would result in a carry, right? So you will get this number, which is which messes up the whole thing. It messes up the, 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 the search algorithm because why does it mess up the whole thing? Because this result here has absolutely no meaning in the context of exact cover. Remember, we want the concept of addition to correspond exactly to the concept of union. And this pesky problem, the carry that we need to do um, uh, in the process of our search, creates this pesky problem. Okay, so how do we fix this? Okay, before I tell you guys, I'll, I'll just pause for a second. And if you guys, if you guys have any suggestions, let me know. Rishab says, and operator. Hmm. So <clears throat> if you do an and, right? So let's test it out. So suppose that we only have two sets and we have two, one, zero, one, one, right? If you do an and, instead of addition, you're doing an and, what do you get? You get zero and you get one. Okay. So what does this say? It says, you know, if you add the, if, what does this say in the context of 
the exact cover. It says, if you take the union of this set and that set, right, you will get a set, you will get this set, which is nonsensical, right? Because the actual union between this and that is 1-1. One, one. So, and, and would not capture correctly, would not capture the union notion that we have in the exact cover. Um, it's, uh, Matthew says XOR. Okay. If you have XOR, Right. It's a one if only if one of them is one. So you will get a one here, but you will get a zero there. So that doesn't work as well. If you look at this thing and you think of this XOR as a union in the context of exact cover, the result that you get does not correspond to a correct union as well. So the solution is hardcore. We are going to completely eliminate the possibility of carry. We will make sure that we do not run into a carry issue when we are crunching these numbers. Remember, we are exhaustively trying every possible combination of adding these guys, right? So we're just going to have to eliminate the possibility of, um, uh, of carry altogether. Um, initial conditions and should be. Yeah. Um, so how do we eliminate the possibility of, of carry? Think about this. If you are operating in, say, base 10, and the total number of sets is less than 10, then there is absolutely no possibility of carry, right? If you have, if we had 10 sets, SI, sorry, if we have nine sets, SI, then regardless of the actual numbers, the maximum ones that you would add in a given digit will be nine and will not result in a carry, right? So we can generalize this, this idea and say, okay, we will just do our arithmetic in a base that is one larger, that is one larger than the number of sets we have. Whoops, I'm handicapped. So we have 12 here. If we do our arithmetic in base 13, there is absolutely no possibility of carry in exactly the same way that if we have nine sets, then we can safely do arithmetic in base 10 without the possibility of carry. In general, if S is M, we do our arithmetic in base M plus one. We are enlarging the base to make uh, carry impossible. If you have 15 items, uh, 15 uh, subset in S, you can do it in base 16, for example, and so on. So to fix the bug in the general eye reduction, instead of each digit being the power of two, we could say, okay, it would be the power to the base S uh, plus one. So if B, B here is, B is the number of sets in S plus one. Uh, and, and we do the arithmetic there. Okay. So now basically our arithmetic will be safe from this carry and every arithmetic operation in the knapsack context will be, will have integrity. It will have a valid semantic meaning in the context of exact cover. And certainly the solution, if we ever find it, the solution made up of one will also have the same, will capture the same semantic meaning, right? Um, remember, 
throughout the search, if you uh, if the subset if the claim solution that you had had at least two member two numbers of it two Ws that have one in the same digit, that digit will at least be two, right? Which is not equal to the correct solution that we are insisting on, which looks something like this one one one. So we are capturing the disjoint requirement by insisting that the solution has to be one in all digits. Uh, there is another option as well. Uh, we can treat Ws, all the weights, and C as base M plus one and do the arithmetic there as well, right? So you can do the, you know, you can generate the numbers as usual as we did originally with the caveat that once you, you know, turn on the algorithm and say, start crunching, that it will do the arithmetic in base M plus one. So that's another option. Okay, so that's good. We're coming out on time. So a few highlights. Where, what are we talking about here? What have we seen, basically? We saw that we can easily turn exact cover into knapsack instance. Notice the word easily, right? I wanted to internalize that and think about it for a second. The reduction does not involve any kind of like search or backtracking or anything. There is no, there is absolutely no, nothing fancy going on. Yeah. These W's are generated deterministically by doing this. Values are constant. This is a number that we just calculate. Bang. That's it. And, and we have our knapsack instant, which we have to solve. Obviously, we still have to solve it. And it, we will still have that pesky search problem. You know, we still have those forks in the road to deal with, right? Um, we haven't dealt with that problem. Yeah. Um, but the reduction itself, the reduction itself did not involve anything fancy. It is fairly deterministic process and, and, and very, very easy. So notice the word easily. We can easily and compare that to the pesky problem of searching the tree. Um, what does this mean? We turn this into the other one. Well, if exact cover is proven by someone that is fundamentally hard, we prove conclusively that this one can never be solved very quickly, then automatically we have to conclude that the knapsack must be as hard as well. Why? Because if the knapsack was easy, the proof that someone came up with would be contradicted because there is an easy way. Translate it to knapsack and solve it using the easy one, right? Um, so that's why, that's why the, it follows that the knapsack is hard if EC is ever proven to be hard itself. Uh, the other thing to notice is that the, the two problems, they are really easy to describe. They are very nice looking, cute problems, except that we seem to be um, stuck with this problem. You know, we start somewhere, we have so many forks in the road, depending on the instance, we have to pick one, we have to come up with an instinct, we have to come up with a heuristic, we have to do something to explore it, and then we make a fork, another fork in the road, and so on. As we, we saw with both, uh, with both problems, sometimes we get stuck. We, okay, this partial solution that we, that we picked, this path in the search space did not lead us anywhere. So we backtrack and we say, okay, this is a, this is a dead end. Let's try something else. We could, we could backtrack and start trying here, or we could, we could, we may find ourselves backtracking all the way to the very beginning. Our very, very choice, if we are unlucky, would be if our very, very choice is totally wrong. So we have to replace it with something else. So we say, okay, let's start over, pick another starting point and try again and so on. Um, so these are like some of the observations that we uh, that we saw with this reduction from uh, from exact cover to knapsack. Um, 
you may say, well, we only spent an hour on this. We haven't thought about it enough, right? And th th surely there must be some heuristics, some way of finding. Well, if you are not insisting on the optimal solution, the optimal solution, the absolute optimal, there is indeed ways to can use heuristics to reach incredible optimization. You could reach a solution that is as close to optimal with a certain uh, confidence threshold, et cetera, et cetera. But here we're insisting on the absolute optimal solution. And we're also insisting on an algorithm that always work in all instances. So you should start thinking about, or, you know, think about these problems in terms of infinite. You know, if, if you, if I came up with a, 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 a knapsack algorithm that works really well in, in practice, think about the infinite set of all problems in knapsack. How will that algorithm do? Is there a guarantee that it will ever um, find the correct solution or not? That's the, the question. If there is such a guarantee, so far at least, over the decades, we find out that, you know, if there is such a guarantee, then the algorithm that you came up with will be will be exponential. Why is it exponential? Because, you know, you look at the search tree. Well, let's, let's look, let's take a, uh, a binary search tree. So you have two forks in the road each time and so on. So if the best we can do is <laughs> stumble our way through the search space and backtrack, right? Um, in the worst case, we're going to have to, if this is the depth of the tree, if n and each at each level we have two choices, then the total number of operation will be two to the power n, which is exponential and very costly. 